Hello, I'm Diana Thomas. And I'm Tom Harper. Welcome to That Will the Smith Show. A podcast about the historical, geographical, natural and human background to the world of Wilbur Smith. eighteen sixty. Africa crouched low on the horizon, like a lion in ambush, tawny and gold in the early sunlight, seared by the cold of the Benguela current. Robin Ballantyne stood by the ship's rail and stared towards it. She'd been standing like that since an hour before dawn, long before the land could be seen. She had known it was there, sensed its vast enigmatic presence in the darkness, detected its breath, warm and spicy dry, over the clammy, cold exhalations of the current on which the great ship rode. It was her cry, not that of the masthead, which brought Captain Mungo St. John charging up the companionway from his stern quarters, and the rest of the ship's company crowding to the ship's side to stare and jabber. For seconds only, Mungo St. John gripped the teak rail, staring at the land, before whirling to call his orders in the low but piercing tone which seemed to carry to every corner of the ship. And so begins... A Falcon Flies, and um, one of Wilbur's finest, I think, books, and certainly most epic in scope, which is saying something, given that being epic in scope is rather his trade, um, or was. Um, and there are th- there's a couple of things that immediately come to mind. The first, purely from a writing point of view, is that it's an absolute object lesson in how you start a book in such a way that you set up all its work a number of its key themes kind of instantly without necessarily the reader realizing that but that's in fact what you're doing so first you have africa in the first paragraph which is going to be i think i think this book is of i mean descriptions of africa and amazing descriptions of africa and its geography and its wildlife are were perhaps wilbur's greatest gift as a writer and, and The Falcon Flies, I think, has some of, if not the best, very close to the best, and I would say possibly the best, of all his descriptions of, of Africa's nature and smell and appearance and wonder and majesty. The second thing is that you straight away, in the second paragraph, meet the heroine of the book. And this is, I think, a big breakthrough and a new thing in Wilbur. This book was written, I think, in 1980. And and Robin Ballantyne is, in my eyes, even more so than Sontaine Courtney, his first great heroine. She's really the, the protagonist and the moral heart of the book. And then in the third paragraph, enter Captain Mungo St. John, who is as splendid and seductive and bad and dangerous and yet at the same time irresistible a a villain of the book as you could possibly ask for and in all of this what this actually is also beginning is the start of the series of books featuring what you might call Wilbur Smith's second family the first of the Courtney's that we've discussed before and this is the Ballantines so Tom How would you distinguish, do you think, what are the key things which, as it were, set one family off against another and the things they represent? Yeah, I think there's a very clear line. I think there's a very clear line in Wilbur's mind when he wrote it, uh, that the Courtney's were, as we sort of discussed previously on the podcast, you know, they're only really one step removed from pirates. Um, They are people who are... I don't think it's a whole... It's not even a whole maybe, step. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, think actually, I think they kind of actually are powerful. <laughs> yes, so anyway. maybe, maybe, maybe age has given them that, that veneer of respectability. Yes. But yes, um, they're, um, they're, they're traders um, and occasionally raiders. Uh, they are very much uh, in it for the money. Um, and 
Yeah, and that very kind of mercantilist approach to to kind of column well to ex- exploration initially, and and then in later stages, kind of um, empire and colonization. Um, they're not interested in the noble um, kind of theory or uh, ideology um, of 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 all, of it all. They're just out to make a quick buck. Um, whereas the Valentines uh, represent the other sort of side of empire, the more as seen at the time, maybe sort of noble motives for empire, although these days we, of course, um, have a big asterisk next to that. Um, and and it's certainly in Robin Ballantyne, you see someone who is whose motives are very pure. I mean, she is the daughter of a missionary and the granddaughter of a missionary. Uh, and her goal uh, in this book is to uh, fight and, if possible, exterminate the slave trade. Uh, and also spread the good news um, of Christianity into into darkest Africa. So she is coming by at it from what by the by the standards of the time were were, were kind of noble motives. Well, I mean, they, they were that and progressive by the standards of the time. I mean, she would have been she would have been considered a, 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 a liberal, um, and 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 I think that's one of the things which is not discussed very much when we talk about empire. Is precisely the fact that for the people, particularly particularly once you get into the Victorian phase, second half of the nineteenth century, it's really seen as as a moral, uh, a moral crusade. I mean, the white man's burden is is there because you, as quotes unquote, well, civilized white people and particularly British people, as it were, know something both about God and about civilization which which it is your duty to go out and give to the rest of the world it's 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 sort of it's 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 yeah it's 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 the price it's it's like noblesse oblige your privilege makes it a, a incumbent upon you to do something and and what's also interesting about robin is that she's doubly progressive because what we learn very quickly is that she's dr robin valentine and has qualified very, very, very unusually for the time as a doctor, m- mostly by pretending to be a, a young man, by pretending to be a boy. And there's an interesting kind of gender and sexual ambiguity about her, which 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 actually continues right the way through the book. She's a really fascinating character on that point of view. And of course, as you say, another thing which is I don't think really appreciated is the degree to which the British Empire, which was by far the most powerful force in the world at that time, used the principal means by which it enforced its power, which is to say the Royal Navy, which I discovered just today actually was using up 10% of the entire government spending of, of the United Kingdom was spent on the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy was used to, to blockade the coasts of Africa intercept all slave ships and basically as you say try to shut the slave trade down so so that attempt is also part as you say of the of the narrative of the book and then of course set against um uh robin's kind of moral righteousness you have two men one of whom is her brother zuga who, like her, is setting out to try and find their father, who's a bit like sort of Livingston or somebody, and has sort of gone off into the depths of Africa and, and, and sort of disappeared from view very famously. And, and But his motivations are much more those of just straightforward power. He wants, he wants, to, make, he wants to make himself rich and famous by discovering his father, writing the book about it, but also, you know, seizing land um a slightly more courtney-esque point of view yeah he's sort of like a sort of henry stanley and cecil rhodes kind of all rolled into one yes yeah and um i think zuka's a fascinating character i think he's really well done by wilbur because you never quite know if you're supposed to like him or not um and he'll do really brave smart um good things that have you really rooting for him all the things that we sort of look for in a hero and then he'll just have this sort of mean streak or this, uh, he'll do something quite nasty. Um, and you think, ooh, am I, am I now supposed to not like him? And again, this is Wilbur giving you the character 
warts and all, and really sort of challenging you as the reader to make up your own mind. The problem for Zuga is a very Victorian novel problem, which is money. I mean, yeah. novelists in the mid-19th century were not at all frightened about, indeed, early 19th century. I mean, money, for example, is absolutely crucial for Jane Austen novel. Everything is, is centered around who has the money. Yeah. And Zuga's problem is he doesn't have money. And he's been quite a successful soldier in India, um, but has not um, been able to afford the lifestyle that is expected of a young officer, because most of the young officers have large private incomes and they're supposed to keep their polo ponies and you know entertain and da, 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 and they're supposed to live in a certain way, which requires money that he doesn't have. Hmm. So he's essentially had to had to leave the army or take leave of it from it to set out and find his fortune. You know, which again is another classic kind of trope of of of, <laughs> of, of, of literature. The, the young man goes out into the world to find his fortune. So for him, he he really has an imperative. He has to he has to find stuff out there in Africa, which is which 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 is you know is is it's, can be monetized as we would now say. Mm-hmm. So he, and his, whether it's his father or treasure or what have you. And the other thing, of course, is that is that they have very different views of their father, because she's still, he's I mean, who's evidently, plainly, an immensely selfish, self obsessed, and again a kind of conflicted thing, because clearly his his religious faith is genuine, but equally clearly so is his lust for glory and fame, as an explorer. Mm. But she adores him with sort of with sort of father daughter hero worship. And, and Zuga has a much more antagonistic relationship, as I guess is a father-son relationship. So again, that's that's another gender-based complexity which comes in, which is that the 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 the, the, the standard father-son dynamic, which has driven so many of Wilbur's books, is complicated in this one by the fact that there's a father-daughter dynamic as well, um, which is very different, and her approach to the whole she wants to find their father so that she can find her father that's what she wants yeah he wants to find their father so that he can write about it you know a la, a la stanley <laughs> finding living yeah. them, and make himself as famous as his father was and as rich and you know and then live the life to which he feels he's entitled yeah and i think uh later on when they find out what happened to their father again their responses are very different um and that's maybe something we can yeah, come yeah. to come to later and then of course you have mango st john who who as i say is like all good villains or all even romantic baddie stroke heroes like a ret butler or somebody he's kind of bad to the bone but well, tell me what you think about him. Oh, I think Mungo St. John is one of Wilbur's all-time greatest creations as a character. And in, in, a, in a gallery which is, you know, heavily peopled by great characters, um, Mungo stands out. And I th- yes, this idea of him being bad to the bone, you keep on thinking he's going to do something to redeem himself. And Wilbur sets up moment after moment after moment where he has the opportunity to do the right thing and he doesn't. Even when he does the right thing, it turns out that he just can't help himself from doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And of course, Robin is caught between this, the twin forces of her intense intellectual, moral disapproval of absolutely everything he stands for, because the ship on which they are sailing to Africa, they've, they've taken his ship, they've taken Mungo St. John's ship um, to get them to to Africa so they can go looking for his fa- for, for their father, the Ballantines. But it turns out that it's a slave ship. Oops. Yes, a minor problem there, since that is precisely what they're trying to, to wipe out. So they're traveling on this ship, which represents everything that she in particular hates most. And he is the absolutely unapologetic trader of slaves. And so she, on one level, loathes him with every fibre of her being, except our minds may think one thing. Our hearts and our bodies, however, may lead us in quite another direction. (laughs) And he's just damn sexy. And she has never had to deal with this before. She's led this very 
as I say this rather sort of asexual life until she suddenly realizes that there is a there is a red blooded woman lurking deep inside of her after all. <laughs> anyway, the fourth major white character in this book is is, is a man called Clinton Codrington, who's a who's a sort of a, a very much like Zuga and indeed like like Mungus and John in his way, absolutely driven. Yeah. He's a sort of he seems like this sort of milk slightly milk toast, soppy, <laughs> you know, religious but a bit sort of happy clappy as we would now say. Um very Church of England. But actually turns out to be again a lot more than you think he is. Yeah. Um because he is leading, he's a captain of a little a steam, a sort of early steam battleship. Um so semi steam it's got a steam engine, but it also has sails. Um, but it's ironclad. So it's one of the first. It's one of the first kind of modern it's, warships. It's, it's sort of like the Toyota Prius of uh, of warships. It's got the sails and it's also got the steam engine. Yes, it's a hybrid. Well, indeed, it's a hybrid. There you go. Whereas, whereas Mungus and John um, sails the most beautiful clipper. I mean, she's she's this gorgeous, incredibly elegant, incredibly fast sail ship. So again, there you have almost like a conflict of the sort of world that's going out and the world that's coming in. And and Codrington, Clinton Codrington, dedicates himself. Another brilliant classic will. Indeed, name. Codrington I think is particularly fine. Yeah, dedicates himself to wiping out slavery by every means possible, and 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 um, so he's as it were the the, the 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 face of the Royal Navy's war on slavery in terms of this book. Yeah, and I think um, again, Will was very clever because. He he introduces Mungo St. John very early. He introduces Clinton Codrington um, soon after that, um, about uh, about thirty pages in. And if you look at the way they are described, um, so Mungo St. John has a thick, dark mane of hair, um, smooth, darkly tanned skin. Um, you know, everything about him is darkness. He is really the prince of darkness. Yes, he is. Whereas Clinton Codrington is pale. Uh, his hair is so white that at first Robin thinks he's an old man. It's like blonde, that kind of yeah. white shade of blonde. Yeah. And it's only when she sees him that she realizes he's actually a young man. Um, and so Mungo is just dark, dark, dark. Clinton is literally whiter than white. Um, and you can imagine them as like the angel and the devil on Robin's shoulders. Neither of them is quite what they seem and and mungo is bizarrely seductive um and and has a certain horrific logic to and sort of um integrity to his position oh, yeah and codrington is a bit of an insufferable prig um and, and also he is he is at least as ruthless and in some ways as mercenary as mungo because one of the things that's kind of interesting is that is that um royal navy seamen um would get prize money i mean that's what always been the case yeah. in terms of of battle of, of enemy ships but if you but but capturing a slave ship was an immensely profitable thing for for the navy and and for and particularly for naval uh, officers and crew they would all share in the profits yeah. of that so so their motivations as much as they are noble and moral are also straight up financial there's there's money to be had they they make as much money from freeing slaves yeah. as somebody else makes by selling them yeah. i mean and indeed to some extent they can be responsible for the deaths of slaves because one of the things that that is made clear is that is that when you know if if you were a, a slaver you were the captain of a slave ship and you saw a royal navy boat coming over the horizon with its cannons trained at you one of the things you did was simply throw the cargo overboard, mm. um, which was a, a human cargo, and they're chained and they go straight down to the bottom, and it's m mass murder. But it's a mass murder occasioned by people who, because somebody who claims to be stopping the slave trade has appeared on the horizon. So those slaves have died at the hands of liberators, if you see what I mean, effectively. Yeah, it's, it's it's very murky, and it's, it's, yeah, Codrington is definitely someone who is doing well by doing good. Um, very good phrase and very true. Yes, and so yes, so and and so as I say, it's again classic Wilbur where he sets up these almost caricatured, 
you know the the devil and angel characters and then undercuts them almost immediately um, and shows the the complexities behind them one of the greatest problems that the the british had when they set about this moral crusade of abandoning sla- slavery was that there were many particularly in, the, in west africa um the king, the kings of the West African kingdoms, um, were absolutely outraged, and and there were there. And there's, I think it's King Giza of um, Dahomey. Oh, Dahomey, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 you know, there were long arguments between the West African states and Whitehall, and the, and the, and the, and the rulers are saying, "Look, you're taking away our principal economic activity, and without it, my, you know, our people are going to starve." Or again, we're not going to be yeah. able to look after them. It's like so. So the and this comes through again in the book that that you know, because one of the things that's kind of a complicating factor of the slave trade is that is that the slaves had to come from somewhere to get to the places where white people bought them, and they came from places that white people hadn't gone to. So therefore. The only people who could acquire and imprison and then begin the the sort of process down the line were other Africans. I mean, that's who was capturing the slaves in the first place. And and their economies depended upon it. So and that that, that is also, I mean, it's it's semi-explicit in this book, but I mean it's it's certainly implicit. Hmm. Um, and that's one of the things, again, it's, it's, it's like so many things, and, and again, Rob is very good about this, about about presenting you with more than one side of an issue. Yeah. And, and indeed, and, 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 and Mungus and John exactly exemplifies that. As you say, he's not just a straight up baddie. He charms the reader as much as he charms, as much as he charms Robin. And, yeah. and, and throughout it, you know, you mean the very, for example, the very, the very um, peoples whose societies I've just been saying um, um, will be described so well are the initial kind of suppliers to the Portuguese slavers who we will encounter in the book who traded at all, and had traded for centuries off the east coast of Africa. Um, so yeah, these things are kind of layer upon layer upon twist upon turn and. Um, but this is a really, it's a multi-layered book, which makes you think about issues which nowadays have been reduced to simplicities. Because, of course, there is a basic, there's a basic moral simplicity, which is slavery is a terrible thing. I mean, that, that's, I think, we can, that's, absolutely, that's not in dispute. The question is, when you move from that, yes, but what actually happens, then stuff gets a lot more complicated and all sorts of, of unexpected and tricky and, uncomfortable directions yeah i was thinking as we were talking just in terms of the of the book structure what's look at the multiplicity and interconnectivity of conflicts emotions so robin uh hates mungo but finds him irresistible likes codrington but thinks he's a bit wet when she's just had mungo (laughs) Um, <laughs> loves her brother but disapproves of him loves her father but is conflicted even then because she kind of knows he's abandoned them Zuga uh, kind of admires Mungo but there's but kind of sort of also feels he's a slightly lesser man is very conflicted in his feelings towards Robin Codrington hates Mungo who hates him adores Robin, who doesn't adore him quite as much. I mean, there there are, and and this is just like the top four characters. There are many more other characters, but there, there's so many interesting little character dynamics that are going on between the four of them in so many different directions. Um, it's not just a case of, as it were, one conflict, which sometimes is the case in, in other world books, where essentially there's one central conflict that drives the whole thing. In this particular case, this, what makes the story really interesting, and one of the reasons it's so capable of surprising you, is that, there, is that the, is the interpersonal relationships are extremely complicated 
in a good way. I mean, they're not, not in the sense you can't follow them, but in the sense that they're subtle and multi-leveled. And, and, they, and, and because there are four main protagonists, you kind of have, you know, to the power of four interesting things going on. Yeah. Um, so as the novel starts, as we said, um, Robin and Zuga have planned their expedition. They have, uh, unfortunately, hitched a ride on Mungo St. John's slave ship. Uh, and then almost the first thing that happens is they encounter this uh, Royal Navy ship that we described. Um, the ship's called the Black Joke, um, which I thought was an odd name. But actually what I discovered um, a while ago was th- this is a, another kind of hallmark of the way Wilbur does things. There was actually an anti-slavery ship called the Black Joke, but she wasn't on this station and she wasn't a steamship. She was actually, she'd actually been a slave ship and she'd been captured by the Navy and refitted. Uh, as a Navy ship um, and worked in the West Africa squadron um, in the uh, 1820s and 30s. Um, a black joke in, in like just about every sense you can possibly imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and one more layer to the joke is that I thought black joke was would have been some reference to slavery or to Africans or something. It turns out it's actually from a, a bawdy drinking song and black joke actually refers to the female genitalia. Oh my God, that I, so, have, that I did not know. There's, there's layers upon layers. Will be, you saucy old man. <laughs> so we started off at sea. They've encountered, uh, they've been, there's been this kind of initial encounter between uh, the black joke uh, and the Huron, which is Mungo St. John's ship. Uh, which is inconclusive because um, the Huron is an American registered ship. And at this point, the British can't board uh, American ships because they haven't signed. In fact, again, every, nothing changes. The Americans haven't signed. Every, every other country has signed a treaty against slavery that lets the British board their ships. And the Americans, uh, you know, American exceptionalism, they, they, they won't allow it. Um, so the Huron gets away. I can't imagine what slave trading America could possibly have to object about. about <laughs> well, America had banned the slave trade. They just hadn't banned slavery itself. Um, okay, slave-owning so. America. You're quite yeah. right, slave-owning America. And as 1860, of course, we're getting to a pretty decisive point in American history where the issue of slavery is going to be Yeah, which actually, again, in a central. tangential way, uh, impacts on the novel. Because I think at the, as the novel opens, 1860, they're, wait, they're sort of awaiting the results of the, uh, the American election. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, Enter Mr. Lincoln. Yeah. So Robin, um, in a sort of very uh, atmospheric scene, explores, goes into the hold of the Huron, finds all the slaving paraphernalia there. And um, again, kind of classic Wilbur scene, decides that what she needs to do is to kill Mungo St. John because he is an yes. evil slaver. So she goes to his cabin at night uh, with a loaded mm-hmm. pistol, um, determined like to kill him, uh, and somehow ends up having sex with him instead. Do you know what? I'm sure she's not the first or the last <laughs> who, who felt who simultaneously felt I really want to kill him. Ooh, but yeah. I, think I, might, I think I might I might just shag him first. But yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you. And uh, and I mean, if you want to you know, sum up Robin's dilemma, I mean that that is it. You know, she's sitting there on the bed with a loaded pistol and um, and ends up sleeping with him instead. Um, that's, <laughs> that's 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 her conflicted feelings right there. Turn, turns out his loaded pistol is better. <laughs> uh, yes, I was trying not to go there, but uh, there we go. Oh, um, no, it's okay. I mean, listen, the book goes there. Let's be frank about this. The book, the book does go there. So, so, so you know, it's, 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 it's a book that's intended you know, for, for grown-ups. Um, yeah. Not in a kind of porn... Not, not, <laughs> I hasten, I hasten to add, not in any kind of disgusting way. But it's, it's, it's fairly evident what happens. It's yeah. not much as hidden. And of course, straight after that, um, they um, have uh, the, the next morning, uh, their, their pillow talk is they debate the nature of the slave trade. Um, and this is again, um, in fact, Robin says, um, now I know you are the devil himself, um, which is sort of basically Mungo's role to be this incredibly seductive sort of devil character. Um, and well, the devil has all the best, he has all the best tunes. Yes. And he, and he, he gives this... Um, justification of slavery um he says you know when you go into the interior of africa you'll see cruelties that no american slave owner would dream of um you know slaughter of human beings by war and disease and wild beasts uh, besides this savagery the barracoons and the slave quarters are an earthly paradise um and i mean it's pretty hard stuff to read um especially because um 
I mean, it's a brave author who will put those words in the mouth of any character, even especially one as seductive as Mungo St. John. I think, I think, I mean, again, you're talking about a book that's written over 40 years ago. And I think, I think um, we were less easily shocked. Um, it, yeah, society goes through periods of license and then periods of reaction to that and sort of more prohibitionist and puritanical and, you know, and, and we're going through quite a sort of reaction to the license of, I suppose, the years from about 1963 to, I don't know, to 2010, something like 2000. But anyway, the second half of the 20th century, which, which, which in which there was this incredible explosion of, of all sorts of forms of freedom. Um, now I think I think that that would certainly would have sensitivity readers just reaching <laughs> for the smelling salts, and they would their sensitivity would just be completely overpowered. But the point about it is, people should be the devil's advocate. Yeah, I mean, characters should do that. People often think there's an idea now that if a if an author writes a character who says bad things, then the author has said those bad things. And and so I think it's precisely the fact that Mungo St. John challenges Robin in both intellectually and morally as, as well as just physically. And so he, he's kind of getting after every part of her. You know what I mean? And 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 I think that's I think that's that's what authors should be doing with their characters. <laughs> yeah. You should be making your bad guy. <laughs> it's like like in a James Bond book. The best of the bad guys are are in their own way also seductive, yeah, and persuasive, yeah. Anyway, as they set off, so so, uh, Mungus and John deposits um, um, the Ballantines, brother and sister, at at the Cape of Good Hope, um, and um, and they think they're gonna they're gonna get rid of him, but in fact they then have to get back on the boat. But while they're in while they're in the Cape, two things happen that are significant to the book. One is that um, um, Suga recruits a kind of group of Hottentot soldiers, local Hottentot soldiers, to be his kind of personal kind of troops, his bodyguard, his his people who are going to accompany him and Robin into the interior, and the sergeant of this troop is called Jan Chirut but also um, Zuga meets a man called Harkness I think isn't he called? Yeah Thomas Harkness Thomas Harkness who ha- who's another kind of explorer stroke hunter who's now um, living in a sort of ha- shanty almost house outside of Cape Town and who possesses the only existing, still very rough, but at least it's something, map of the interior. Because one of the things, one, it's kind of astonishing, really, that even in the second half, here we are, 1860. So this mm. is the age, you know, there are railways, there are, there are telegraphs, there are machine guns, there are all sorts of things which are really harbingers of the 20th century in the modern world. And yet, even at this point, huge areas of Africa were entirely unexplored by white people. And there just were great big blanks on the map. And even at this point, people thought, well, it's just all... The bit they knew was the Sahara, or New York, and they just sort of thought, well, basically, it's just desert all the way down, kind of thing. And we, you know, we don't know where the desert stops. There must be jungle at some point. Cause we know from the coasts, but but basically, the interior is this desolate place, but dangerous. It's just full of danger. It's full of it's full of things that are frightening, whether they're animals or diseases or people or whatever. People people haven't gone into it, and it's just astonishing to think that, you know, forty years before the beginning of the of the twentieth century, that mm. that 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 just so much of this planet in an area which after all is where we all come from to begin with was completely unknown so, but anyway the, to the extent that it is known this map has the sort of sketchy outlines almost like a sort of 
medieval Mapa Mundi, mm. you know, where the continents are all drawn in weird shapes. And they sort of think there's something called an island called Brazil somewhere <laughs> in the Atlantic. And, you know. um, and so, yes, yeah, so he, so, so Zuga gets hold of this map in ways I went, because that might be a bit of a spoiler, but he does get hold of it. Yeah. And they're obliged to get back on board the boat, aren't they? On, onto, onto, it's, onto. it's the hero and it's, it's um, Mungo St. John's ship, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, 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 the Harkness scene I love because it's, um, it reminded me actually very much of an Indiana Jones sort of scene where, you know, you've got the old, the grizzled old explorer on his deathbed handing over that, which handing over this kind of hand-drawn map with sort of sketchy details. Um, and in fact, he talks about, um, you know, the kingdom of Ophir, um, which is uh, kind of the Queen of Sheba. Um, so it's all, it's King Solomon's Mines, it's Indiana Jones, it's that whole um, adventure kind of tradition right there. It's a, it's a wonderful scene. You're quite right. They, um, go up, they go up the east coast of Africa, and they're, and which had been colonized um, by, by the Portuguese. I mean, back in the yeah. late fifth. I think they first reached the East Coast of Africa in the 15th century. I mean, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. No, they've been there for hundreds of years, yeah. And and they're going to go up the Zambezi. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm nervous now. <laughs> but but <laughs> as they, I mean, uh, 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 which is going to take them, the river is going to take them into this, the heart of Africa, as indeed it does. Um, yeah. And and at this point, I think there's a really amazing sustained piece of natural writing because the, the river begin river has a sort of delta, and and lots and lots of effluent of various kinds, animal, vegetable, and mineral, comes down the river and is washed into the sea, and the sharks and the crocodiles all kind of gather in various layers either out to sea or on the fringes of the mm. delta to feast upon all the sort of detritus that's coming down the river. And when they go into the Delta, and really from that point on, it's, it's, there are passages of writing, which make any of those of us who've worked with Wilbur think, okay, I just couldn't do that. Mm. <laughs> yes, I had exactly the same reaction as, as I was rereading this. I, was, uh, I mean, yeah. you know, for example, Robin has sex with Mungo. Yeah, I could write that. Yeah, yeah, mm. I could do that. But yeah. the the inc- but it's an, every it's the little tiny passing references to what a little bird is looking like, or the sound it's making, or the colours of the sky, or the smell of the earth, or just it's the richness. And the layering of the physical detail. And the, the one that got me, um, and there's, there's, as you say, there's, it's all over the book. Um, it's yeah. incredibly rich. Um, there's a bit, this is a, bit, a little bit later on, um, where Zuga's trapped at the bottom of a cliff and there's some people at the top of the cliff dropping right. rocks on him. Oh, yes, and he's trying yes. to work out how he can get up there to, 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 to shoot them. Um, and he's stuck at the bottom of this, of this apparently sheer cliff cliff um and then it's this is what what wilbur writes um almost immediately zuga discovered another ledge rising from the one on which he stood the tiny feet of the little rock hyrax that used it had put a light sheen on the rock and it was this that had drawn zuga's attention to the narrow pathway yes and i just thought never in a million years i mean first of all i will confess i've never heard of a rock hyrax and i can't even imagine what it looks like i have to google it um but this idea that the paw prints of this tiny animal have marked the trail that that yes. a man can spot just uh, it's that level of detail yes. that no one would ever ever get unless they had kind of been in that sort of place and the hier- lived that for some hi- he did the hyrax sounds like a creature from a dr seuss book it does doesn't it yeah um I'm like, sorry, I'm I think there, there's, there's a lorax, and then... oh, it's cute. It, it's a bit it's like fluffy. A... it's fluffy. It's fl- in the book. It's, it's fluffy. Fl- fluffy, yes. It's kind of like a cross between a um, what are those animals that pop up uh, out of holes? Like a gopher. A gopher, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a cross between a gopher and a beaver. 
That's how I'm <laughs> going to describe it. Okay, yeah. it's a Bofa or a Giva. <laughs> yes. Um, but beavers aren't. Are beavers fluffy? I don't, I don't even think it's fluffy. Interestingly, sorry, I'm, I'm just geeking out here on Wikipedia. Uh, descended from a common ancestor with the elephant. Ah, well, now speaking of the elephant. Well, the elephant, yeah. The um, elephant plays plays a, quite a major part in the book. He, he, there's a there's there's a really magnificent old bull elephant, who's who's as says, um, he's been shot and hunted for decades, and um, and then Wilbur tells you something which which completely ennobles the elephant, which I had no idea about, and and he's talking about the elephant and his two and his the two almost as old, but not quite as old, bulls who are his sort of sidekicks and protectors, one of whom sacrifices their life for him. And he says, together they had trekked tens of thousands of miles from the Kashan Mountains in the far south, across the burning waterless wastes of the Kalahari Desert, along the dry riverbeds where they'd knelt and with their tusks dug for water in the sand. They'd wallowed together in a shallow lake of Ngami while the wings of the waterfowl darkened the sky above them, and they'd stripped the bark from the forests along Limnyati and Chobe and crossed those wide rivers, walking on the bottom with just the tips of their trunks raised above the surface to give them breath. Over the seasons they'd swung in a great circle through the wild land that lay north of the Zambezi, feasting on the fruits of different forests scattered over a thousand miles, timing their arrival as each crop of berries came into full ripening. They'd crossed lakes and rivers, had stayed long in the hot swamps of the Sud, with the midday heat reaching 120 degrees, soothed the aches in the old bull's bones. But then the wanderlust had driven them on to complete the circle of their migration, south again over mountain ranges, ranges across the low alluvial plains of the great rivers, following secret tra trails and ancient passes that their ancestors had forged and which they had first trodden as cards of their mother's flanks. And I mean, there in 250 words, I should think, is just a description of something of which I'd had no real inkling, yeah. which is the fact that in the same way that whales had used to be able to travel the oceans for thousands upon thousands of miles, making themselves heard across huge distances. So elephants on land had had the whole of Africa as their kingdom and, 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 and knew their way around the entire continent. And there's, another, there's a bit just before that, I think, where, where in, order to, in order to follow the, the elephants, um, um, Zuga and Jan Chirut and, and his bearers behind him, his gun bearers, have, have walked along a path created by the elephants kind of along the side of a mountain. Yeah. So the elephants were, were making their roads across Africa. And, and in that description, quite apart from the, from the very kind of humanizing ways in which the animal itself is described, the fact that these amazing creatures are then going to be slaughtered and that their lands are going to be encroached upon and that their range is going to be cut down and down and down and down and their lives diminished just becomes heartbreaking. I mean, absolutely heartbreaking. And, and again, I'm sort of as a reader, I was deeply moved but also kind of wow i never knew that and as a writer it's like okay i surrender i give up <laughs> forget it yeah <laughs> can't do that okay you win um but you know that's just in those 250 words you have a whole world opened up to you that you simply didn't know about and in a way you've gone on the same vo journey of exploration that the characters have gone on. Yeah. You, you kind of you kind of in the same way they are learning about the land and they are learning about the animals and the people, so are you. Um and it's it's a tremendously 
uh, entertaining, but also moving experience, which makes this, I think, more, as much as it is, a rattling good yarn and a page turning adventure. I I think, and I think it's I think, for example, if you compare it with you know, um, with the, with the first Courtney books, this is the work of of a much more experienced, mature writer. Yeah. With A Falcon Flies, he is writing about, essentially, I think, by talking about the the exploration of the land that will become North and South Rhodesia, yeah. which will then become uh, Zimbabwe and Tanzania, I think. Uh, Zambia, I think. Zambia, yes. Zambia, Zambia. yeah. I always yeah. guess, you're right. Um, uh, but in other words, Wilbur's homeland. He's writing about his yeah. homeland. And that the Ballantine saga, I think, was conceived as basically a series charting the history of Zimbabwe uh, and Zambia. Yes, exactly. So there he's writing from, and it's very evident, like when he's talking about the Hyrax, he's he's not gone, not that Wikipedia existed then, but he's not, he, he knows about that because he's seen those footmarks. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the feeling you get. Yeah, oh, yeah there's and no I, way I, you I, could imagine that, I think. You have to no. assume that. That's the definite no. feeling I got. And, and, and that comes right through the whole book and all the the way he describes the different trees and that that's coming from direct personal experience is peak Wilbur and peak Africa. And we still yeah. have not really dealt with what happens in it. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think just to uh, bring everyone up to speed. So as you say, uh, the expedition, Robin and Zuga are uh, taken, uh, they're, they're dropped off by, by Codrington. They're taken up the Zambezi. Um, and then there's uh, an encounter and also a decision point, which are important for the rest of the book. The encounter is with a Portuguese uh, bastard, I think we can say, yeah. because he is the illegitimate son of the Portuguese yes, go uh, governor, um, called Camacho Pereira. Who is, in fact, a who is also a complete bastard. Uh, yeah, but a bastard in, in every sense so, yes. of the word. Um I mean, it's fair to say Wilbur has many, you know, we've talked about some of these incredibly complex uh, and challenging characters that Wilbur's created. Camacho Pereira is not one of them. He's just a baddie. Um, hey, well, yeah, but, but to be fair, he's a baddie who's given his motivation. I mean, if, if you're playing the role of Camacho and you ask the director, what's my motivation? It's there. Yes. I mean, the, his frustrations, his sense of, 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 of being the bastard and therefore not taken seriously and, and being you know, lesser than and his desire to make up for that. So so he's somebody who does have he has he has drives that that make sense of his actions, if you see what I mean. Yeah. They don't just And of course in true Wilbur style, the first thing that tells us that Camacho is a baddie is the fact that he is a indiscriminate and bad hunter. Uh, so as they go along <laughs> yes, the river, yes, yes. he just takes pot shots at anything, slaughters indiscriminately, oh. but uh, tends to miss the, the bigger targets. Yes. Um, so this is our, for, in the sort of taxonomy of, of how Wilbur kind of characterizes people. He's clearly no good. Yes, evidently. Um, yeah. And uh, the second thing he does is he uh, takes a fancy to Robin uh, Ballantyne. Yes. Uh, and uh, plans to make his move on her she of course uh, will have nothing to do with it no. uh, and the third thing that Camacho does is that he encourages them very strongly to go north uh, because there's this question if they're looking for their father full of Ballantyne the question is this is he, they know they got this far uh, did he go north or south north would be to look for the headwaters of the Nile south would be to look for this sort of fabled kingdom of Mono Um and Pereira encourages them very strongly. In fact, he uh, lies to them to encourage them to go north. Um, and the reason for this, we will discover, is that he is heavily involved in the slave trade that is being run out of the south. Which goes, which goes to my point about where the slaves come from. Yeah, I mean th th that's 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 the point which you realize. Oh yeah, of course, they have to be supplied by somebody. Yeah, and in fact, what what we're seeing here is that. It's everybody from the Africans of the interior who are kind of finding the slaves, the Portuguese um, who are acting as the middlemen, and then yeah. the the kind of uh, white Americans and, and other nationalities who are then acting as as, as the traders um, and yes. then taking them off to the uh, mainly to the New World, but also to other places. 
um, to uh, to be enslaved. Um, so Zuga, uh, and this is one of Zuga's kind of um, good moments, if you like. Uh, Zuga sees through the ruse, and he decides to take the expedition south. Yes. Um, they and they set off to the south. Uh, they there are a number of adventures, uh, including a uh, falling out with um, Camacho, in which Camacho comes off very much the worse. And then they sort of climb these mountains, and this is actually the bit that we were just talking about with the rock hyrax and with uh, the elephants that they find. Uh, they yeah. climb these mountains, uh, and they get to. You talked about the elephant road, um, and it's not just the road. The roads also have a gate, I think, pretty much at the top of the mountain uh, that Will describes these stone portals, invisible from below, which mark the beginning of the ancient elephant road, uh, symmetrically formed in fractured rock and had eroded through the softer layers, leaving straight joints, so they seemed to have been worked by a mason. Um, Zuga saw how over the centuries the elephant's rough skin had worn the stone smooth as thousands upon thousands of elephants had squeezed through the gap. Um, and this is, this is again operating on, on a lot of levels. This is the portal to the unknown. They've been kind of enchanted mm. territory more or less until now, and now it's the kind of the classic crossing the threshold, going through the doorway into into the other world. Yes, and the other thing, of course, is that when they get through uh, the gate, far from finding some inhospitable desert or even jungle, what they find is a kind of Eden. I mean, it's a beautiful, amazing. Uh, landscape which just rolls away kind of forever um which which is you know plainly just in in the eyes of 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 people who are colonialist just waiting for someone to plow it all up or you know build build houses on it or cities on it or whatever it's just this it's just a, a paradise it's gonna say nothing like finding a paradise and then they paved paradise and put up a parking lot um as uh, Janie mitchell said um but as yet, they've just discovered paradise. This is pretty much the midpoint of the book. Um, aptly, they've, as you said, the roller coaster has taken them to the top of the mountain, uh, and they're looking down on all the adventures they're going to have. And unfortunately, we've uh, more or less run out of time for this episode. Uh, we've actually run out of time for about three episodes. This happened. <laughs> uh, as we said, there is a lot in this book. Uh, so in the next episode, uh, we will be looking at everything that happens when they come down from this mountain pass into this sort of fabled paradise of lost cities and uh, undiscovered uh, marvels. Um, but for this week, that's all we've got time for. But the good news is, well, I hope it's the good news, um, is that we will be back to talk you through every one of those twists and turns um, with more action, more animals, more slavery, more sex, and just more of everything, really. Um, so until next time, it's goodbye from me, Diana. And it's goodbye from me, Tom Harper. Smith's show is produced by Christopher Wynn. Music by Dewey DeLay.